history professor Stephen Gillon details the hours following the Kennedy assassination on November 22, 1963, and the transfer of the presidency to Lyndon Johnson. Mr. Gillon uses newly declassified archival sources to explore the first hours of the Johnson administration. Barnes & Noble in New York City hosts the hour-long event. You know, I think the question, when you write a book like this, the first question that you have to answer is, do we really need another book about the Kennedy assassination? Is there anything new to be said about the assassination of President Kennedy? Are there new materials that, are, that have suddenly become available and have not been available for the past 46 years that allow us to see these events in a different light? And obviously, my answer to that question is yes, for very selfish purposes. Um, most of the books, the vast majority of books, and you, know, you could fill a small library with, with uh, books and articles that have been written about the assassination, they focus on one question, one singular question, and that is, who shot JFK? Where did the bullets come from? Was there a shooter on the grassy knoll? Was Oswald, was Oswald a patsy? You know, was this part of a, a coup on the part of the military industrial complex because of initiatives that Kennedy had taken? These issues are fascinating and they have inspired what is and remain and will remain a passionate debate among people on all different sides of of this issue that's not what this book is about i am not writing a book about who shot jfk i have no new theories to offer about where the bullets came from or who shot jfk this is actually a very different book what i'm interested in is not who shot jfk i'm interested in the transfer of political power that takes place in the hours after the assassination. And I want to move the focus away from the tragedy that's unfolding in the presidential limousine and move it back about 60 feet to the car carrying Lyndon Johnson. Follow Lyndon Johnson over the course of the day as he goes to Parkland Hospital and then to Air Force One and then back to Washington, D.C. to give people a sense of the texture of the decisions that he had to face and the choices that he confronted. When you think about it, the Kennedy assassination represented the most dramatic and sudden transfer of political power in American history. Kennedy was the first chief executive to die instantly from his wounds, even Abraham Lincoln who was shot at point-blank range at the Ford Theater, survived and lived until the following morning when he died. Kennedy died instantly, which confronted Johnson with what I believe was an unprecedented crisis. What I'm interested in is the issues of crisis management and presidential leadership in the hours that followed the assassination. And I focus on the first 24 hours, you know, which is very different from other books that I've written and the books that other professional historians, right? Because normally what we're trying to do is to connect the dots, to tell the story of change over a period of time. But what I try to do here instead is to focus on a single 24-hour period to give you a sense of the texture of the moment. You know, my students over the years have always complained that, that number one, I talk too fast, and number two, that history is boring. They say history is boring because we know the conclusion. We know the end of the story, so why do we need to learn about dates and names and times? And I, what I find fascinating about history is being able to go back in a moment of time and understand that the past has many different possible paths, that there are lots of possibilities, choices that were not taken, and to put people back in that moment at that time to understand the range of choices, in this case, that Lyndon Johnson faced, and to realize how contingency and unintended consequences play in the historical process and produce a result which no one at the time could have anticipated. And by focusing on 24 hours, by, by focusing on some of the, deal, the details that oftentimes get airbrushed out of history, I think we're able to transport people back to that moment. So you not only can now, with the benefit of hindsight, get a sense of to reevaluate some of the decisions that Lyndon Johnson made, but you can also put yourself back in that moment. So you're at Parkland Hospital, and someone comes to you, and you, you have the same information in front of you that Lyndon Johnson had in front of him. You find out the president has been shot, that this is possibly the first uh, in, uh, shot in what could potentially be a confrontation with the Soviet Union. What do you do in that moment? What choices do you make? I know what I would do. I would hyperventilate and pass out. That's why I'm a professor and not a president. But it allows the individuals, people who are reading this book, the idea is to allow people to go back in that moment of time and experience it, and experience the same type of situations and the same choices that Lyndon Johnson confronted.
And not only is the, the framework different, but I also, in terms of the issue, there are new sources that are available. And uh, I am very grateful to the family of William Manchester, who gave me access to uh, all of the research materials that Mr. Manchester used to write his very controversial and best-selling book, uh, The Death of a President, was published in 1967. And if you go back, these materials were opened up last year for the first time. I was the first one to use them. And these materials, you know, almost all of these people, with a few exceptions, are now dead. But when you go back and you look at the interviews, Manchester interviewed all the major players back in 1964 and 1965 when this material was still fresh. And these people come alive. And what also comes alive are some of the, the human dimensions to this story, the human dim dimensions that have been, I think, left out of the Warren Commission, for example, which, as you know, is a legal brief, which is sort of very clinical and very concise, but also uh, uh, it is not, it's focused on solving a, pr a crime, and it's not focused on Lyndon Johnson or his actions after, um, uh, after the assassination. And I also found that people just volunteered and gave Manchester material material that was not available to the Warren Commission. So there are, for example, documents uh, in the Manchester Papers which he chose not to use and parts of interviews which he chose not to use, which I think provide a fresh light, new perspective on the events that took place that day. I also, I, I sought out the Manchester Papers and I found them there at Wesleyan University in the Special Collections uh, Archive at Wesleyan University. I also came across a very valuable and useful oral history that was conducted by the, president, the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library in 1978 with Brigadier General Godfrey McHugh. And McHugh was President Kennedy's Air Force aide on November 22, 1963. And this, is, this is just falls into the category of pure dumb luck. I happened to be working at the Kennedy Library on the day, 31 years after he conducted the interview, that McHugh's interview was declassified. So within hours of it being open to the public, I was able to get access to it and use it in this book for the first time. And I want to talk a little bit later on about some of the insights that this um, oral history provides us. But finally, there are just, because I'm asking different questions of the material, there's a lot of information that's been open to the public for a long time that other people looking into this issue have not focused on. There's a, at both the Johnson Library and at the National Archives in Washington, D.C., for example, there is a report conducted by the Secret Service where all the Secret Service agents involved in the, uh, the presidential detail and the vice presidential detail gave very detailed reports of what they were doing on that day, what they saw, and when they saw them. Now, most people, the few people who have used this report have been looking at it primarily to glean information about the assassination. But if you look at it instead to try to get a sense of what Lyndon Johnson is doing, you get this this, this uh, great understanding of, of Lyndon Johnson and every step he's taking and who's in the room and who he's talking to, and it's really essential in trying to tell the story. So, so what do you end up with and what's new? So there's new questions you're asking using a different format and you have new sources. So what is it that I'm able to say about November 22nd, 1963 that no one has said before? Well, the first part of the story that I think is important is the events that take place in Parkland Hospital, the roughly 40 minutes that Lyndon Johnson is at Parkland Hospital from 1240 until around 130 when he leaves for Air Force One. And the question that I try to, the question that I asked of the material, which has not been asked before, is why does it take so long for Lyndon Johnson to find out that Kennedy is dead? According to the Warren Commission, Kennedy is shot at 12.30. They arrive at, the, at Parkland Hospital at 12.40. Kennedy is pronounced dead at 1 o'clock. Lyndon Johnson finds out that Kennedy is dead at 1.20. I think that timeline is actually wrong for reasons I'd be happy to elaborate on later. But here's what happens. Lyndon Johnson, just to set the stage for Parkland Hospital, Lyndon Johnson is two cars behind President Kennedy in the motorcade as they turn on the Dealey Plaza. When the first shot rings out, Johnson hears it, and he doesn't think anything of it. He said he's been in motorcades his whole life. For him, it was just, it sounded like backfire from a motorcycle. He wasn't the least bit alarmed. Rufus Youngblood, who was a Secret Service agent sitting in the front seat of the car, hears the same sound. He's also not alarmed. But what he sees does alarm him. He looks out, and he's looking now at the grassy knoll, where the vice presidential car is making the turn onto Elm. And he sees people falling to the ground. And then he looks ahead and he sees in front of him, he sees what he describes as unusual movements in the presidential car. So Youngblood leaps out of the front seat of the car and he jumps over the back seat and he grabs Lyndon Johnson and he throws him to the floor of the car. And as Johnson is being thrown to the floor of the car, you hear the second shot and the third shot. And depending on what theories you believe, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth shot. 
But Lyndon Johnson is on the floor of the limousine. He hears these shots, but he doesn't see anything. He hasn't seen anything in a presidential motorcade. As soon as he's on the floor and, and, and Rufus Youngblood, all 180 pounds of Rufus Youngblood are on top of him, the car picks up speed. They begin this frantic race to Parkland Hospital. Johnson doesn't know what's going on. He feels the car accelerate. He hears, we have to realize, this car is going 70 miles an hour. It's an open limousine. The air is blowing through it. The radio is at full blast. Lance Johnson wanted to hear the, how the local radio stations were covering the motorcade, so he had the radio on the whole time. So they're racing the Parkland Hospital. He keeps looking over to make sure Lady Bird is okay. But he hears some chatter over the Secret Service channel, but he doesn't really know what is taking place and what's happening. Rufus Youngblood, at one point, there's so much noise that in order to talk to Johnson, he leans down and yells into his ear, we're going to a hospital. Uh, it's possible that there's been an incident in the presidential motorcade. When we get to the hospital, we're going to take you to a secure location. Do you understand? And Johnson says, yes, partner. So they pull up to Parkland, Parkland Hospital. And I realize that Johnson's car is just a few seconds behind President Kennedy's uh, uh, limousine. The Kennedy limousine is parked a few yards away, and the president is laying in the arms, in the lap of the first lady. But Johnson doesn't see any of this, because as soon as they screech to a halt, agents surround him, they rush him in the Parkland Hospital, they take him to minor medical. They close the blinds, they move, remove people, they put a guard at the gate, and put him in booth 13 in minor medical. So there you have Lyndon Johnson, Lady Bird, Rufus Youngblood, in a, in a room with a sterile metal operating table, examination table, and two plastic chairs. That's all, at this point, Lyndon Johnson knows nothing. So the question then is, is, why does it take so long for him to get information about what's happened to the president? Just about everybody else in the presidential motorcade has either, either saw the shots or they saw Kennedy's body when they arrived at Parkland Hospital and they had an understanding of just how serious this was. So Johnson wants information. He wants to know what's going on. He doesn't know whether Connolly's been shot, the president's been shot, the first lady, or whether no one's hurt. He gets his first report from Emory Roberts, who was the shift supervisor of the Secret Service. Now, Emory Roberts, as soon as the car is pulled into Parkland Hospital, Emory Roberts jumps out of the backup car and goes to the presidential car. He opens up the back door, and he wants to get a sense of what the pres how serious the president's wounds are. And he lifts up the first lady's arm and looks at the president's head. And he tells William Manchester, in the interview he did with Manchester, that at that moment he knew that Kennedy was dead, and that Lyndon Johnson was President of the United States. And he said, my Secret Service manual tells me to protect the President of the United States, and that was Lyndon Johnson. So he says to Roy Kellerman, you stay with Kennedy, I'm going to Johnson. So he goes into, he's the first person to give a report to Lyndon Johnson. Now, Roberts has already made up his mind that Kennedy is dead and Johnson is President, but when he sees Johnson, that's not what he says. What he says to Johnson, his first report to Johnson, he says, I have seen the President's wounds, and I don't think he can survive. And Johnson says, I need more information. I want to hear it from Kenny O'Donnell, who was, his title was uh, appointment secretary. He was, in fact, the sort of chief of staff of, uh, for the Kennedy, uh, the Kennedy White House. And he wants to hear from Roy Kellerman, who was President Kennedy's uh, Secret Service agent. So Emory Roberts leaves the room. As he leaves the room, he runs into Lem Roberts, who's another, Lem Johns, who's another Secret Service agent, who had arrived at the hospital late and didn't see anything that happened. And he says to Roberts, have you seen uh, what's the, the president's condition? And he says very matter-of-factly, the president is dead. And later, Roberts told William Manchester, he said, Johnson didn't know what I knew, which is that Kennedy was dead. The next person who comes in is Roy Kellerman. Roy Kellerman was, the, was in the limousine, the presidential limousine. He was one of the people who helped lift Kennedy's lifeless body from the, uh, from the car onto a stretcher and to bring him into Parkland Hospital. He walks into Johnson. He says, the president's condition is not good. Well, anyone who has seen the president's wounds, that's an understatement. The president's condition is more than not good. The president's condition is fatal. And then a few minutes later, Kenny O'Donnell comes back, and he says the, condition, the president was in a bad way. So what I'm struck by is that all these people, Kenny O'Donnell had, was riding in a car 15 feet behind Kennedy when he sees the fatal third shot, and he turns to Dave Powers, he says he's dead. So what I'm struck by, the question I'm asking myself is, why doesn't anyone state the obvious? Why doesn't anyone come to Lyndon Johnson and say, Mr. Vice President, the President has suffered a major head wound. Even if doctors are able, through some miracle, to keep his heart beating, he clearly can no longer function as President. You need, as of this moment, to assume the powers of the Presidency. But they never say that. And, I, and the question is why? 
Why are they reluctant to say that? And, I, in the book, I explore sort of all the different dimensions of this. And I think there's lots of different reasons. Obviously, grief and confusion and chaos all play a role in it. But I think there's also the issue that most the Kennedy people simply cannot accept the idea that Lyndon Johnson is now president of the United States. They, this is a man who they detest. And it's, it's hard enough for them to accept that their leader, this man who they loved, John F. Kennedy, was now dead. But it was just too much for them to accept and to have to verbalize that Lyndon Johnson, the man who they ridiculed, who they never wanted to be vice president in the first place, was now going to occupy the chair that John F. Kennedy once occupied. So they're not able to tell him that. They're able, they give him the right advice. They all tell him, get on the plane and fly back to Washington. So they tell him what they should have told him. But they can't bring themselves to tell him that Kennedy is dead and that he needs now to assume the powers of the presidency. So this is, the, this, this is I think, one of the, the sort of the uh, issues that, that you have to deal with in talking about Parkland Hospital, but there's another dimension to it. What, while people like Kenny O'Donnell cannot bring themselves to acknowledge that Kennedy is dead and, and to tell Lyndon Johnson that he's now president, they give him the right advice. But Lyndon Johnson, his own insecurities are being played out at Parkland Hospital. Johnson clearly has enough information. He knows from Emory Roberts that the Kennedy is in very serious condition and may likely die. So why doesn't Johnson seize power? Why doesn't Johnson rec assume the powers of the presidency, having a just general understanding of what Kennedy's condition is? And the problem is that Lyndon Johnson is so paranoid about Robert F. Kennedy, and he's so afraid that if he appears to be overreaching, that if he appears to be literally stepping over the body of a dead president in order to assume the powers of the presidency, that he'll be perceived as being out of line and that the Kennedys will use this against him. He said in a taped phone conversation later on that uh, he was afraid those first couple of days that, that, um, that Robert Kennedy was going to do everything he possibly could to deny him the, the, the presidency. So Johnson, you have this stalemate. You have this standoff in the minutes after the assassination. On the one hand, the Kennedy people will not tell Lyndon Johnson that he's president, and Lyndon Johnson will, refuses to assume the power. So what you have is a vacuum in Parkland Hospital, and you have an unacceptable period of time. You have 40 minutes when the United States is without a functioning commander-in-chief. And from recognize, remember, this is a year after the Cuban Missile Crisis. This is the peak of the Cold War. If anything, the imperative at that time should have been to maintain a chain of command. But for 40 minutes, we are without a functioning commander-in-chief. And I spent a lot of time in the book focusing on that, those 40 minutes in Parkland Hospital and trying to explain this dynamic, and this dynamic is significant because it really sets the stage for the, the, the relationship between Kennedy and Johnson, the Kennedy people and, the, and Johnson, not only over the next 24 hours, but over the course of Lyndon Johnson's presidency. So just move the story ahead to another sort of critical moment that I think is new and interesting uh, that we haven't seen before. And this comes courtesy of General, Brigadier General Godfrey McHugh. McHugh was uh, with the presidential party in, uh, on November 22nd. And uh, just to set the stage again, uh, you know, what happens at Parkland Hospital, Johnson, when he's finally told Kennedy is dead, he leaves, he goes to Air Force One, he's waiting for the First Lady to show up with the body of the president to fly back to Washington. Uh, the Kennedy people put the body in a casket, and they're ready to leave the hospital, and a local official, a justice of the peace, and a coroner tell him he can't take the body that the assassination of a president is not a federal crime, it's a local crime, it's governed by local law, which means that the autopsy has to be done in Dallas. Well, the Kennedy people are not ready, not prepared to leave. They just watched their beloved president be assassinated. They're not going to leave his body behind. Mrs. Kennedy makes clear she's not leaving without the body of the president. So they essentially kidnap the body of the president of the United States. They force their way past the local justice of the peace. They load the car onto an ambulance, to a hearse. They bring it out to Air Force One. They quickly carry this heavy casket up the steps, put it in the back of the plane, strap it in. As soon as they do that, Kenny O'Donnell says to McHugh, get this plane in the air. We have to realize O'Donnell is afraid that the Dallas police are coming behind them. The Dallas police are in, a, uh, in their cars. They're going to surround the plane. They're going to board the plane, drag the body off, and bring it back and perform an autopsy in Dallas. So he wants to get this plane in the air. So McHugh, who's, who is the, the Air Force aide to the president and is responsible for maintaining the, the, air for, the uh, Kennedy uh, fleet, 
goes to the front of the plane. He says to Captain Swindell, get this plane in the air. And Swindell is sort of vague. He says, well, I can't because there's going to be a ceremony on board and we're not really sure. And, and eventually McHugh finds out that Lyndon Johnson is on the plane. And the Kennedy people don't know that. They think Johnson has taken the other plane, the plane he flew in on, which was then Air Force Two, and is already on his way back to Washington. So the story McHugh tells in this oral history, which was released, declassified for the first time last year, and which was revealed in this book for the first time, this is what he says. He's walking up and down the plane. He's looking for Lyndon Johnson. He can't find him. Lyndon Johnson's six foot four. He's a tough guy to miss. So he realizes the only place he hasn't looked is the presidential bedroom. So he opens up the door and he looks in the presidential bedroom. No Lyndon Johnson. So the only place on the plane he hasn't looked is the bathroom. The bathroom in the presidential bedroom on Air Force One. So he walks into the bedroom by his own account. This, these are, this is his account. He walks into the bedroom and he opens up the bathroom door. You know what he finds? He finds Lyndon Johnson. He finds Lyndon Johnson, he says, crawled up in a ball on the floor of the bathroom, his hands covering his face, crying hysterically. It's a conspiracy. It's a conspiracy. They're going to kill us all. They're going to kill us all. Now that... I wonder what he did next. Like, excuse me, and <laughs> close the door. What do you do after you've seen this? Um, the, this, this story of, uh, of uh, what McHugh claims to have seen at, uh, on, aboard Air Force One runs against every other view of Lyndon Johnson's actions that day. Everybody who witnessed, who saw Lyndon Johnson, observed Lyndon Johnson that day, said he was cool, calm, and collected. Even the Secret Service agents. And the Secret Service agents don't really like Lyndon Johnson. Actually, when you write a book about Lyndon Johnson, you realize most people don't like Lyndon Johnson. But they have, there's no reason why they're going to say anything nice about him. But they all observed that he's subdued this day, which is appropriate given the occasion. So McHugh's account runs counter to every other account we have of Lyndon Johnson that day. So the question I had to grapple with is, is it true? You know, how 46 years later can you determine that an encounter between two men, both of whom are now dead, ever took place? So I, um, in the book, I lay out why, the reasons why I think the, um, what McHugh says is true and also the reasons why I am suspicious. And I leave it up to the, to the reader to, to make up their own minds about whether, how credible uh, General McHugh's account of Lyndon Johnson's behavior on Air Force One is. And finally, I think what this book, it does something that very few books do, which is it paints a fairly positive portrait of Lyndon Johnson. I think when you look at the, the, the circumstances that Lyndon Johnson faced on November 22, 1963, he handled the crisis remarkably well. What Johnson understood, you have to realize when you're dealing with a situation like this, you know, there's no manuals to read. There's no books to read about, about how to behave. Johnson doesn't have advisors around him who are giving him uh, choices or making recommendations, pick box A, B, or C. Lyndon Johnson is governing with his gut. It's his instinct. It's, this, is, this is leadership at its very basics. This is Lyndon Johnson deciding on his own what's right and what's wrong, making decisions based on fragmentary evidence. And what Lyndon Johnson understands instinctively is that the single most important message he can convey on this day is continuity. He needs to send a message to the American public, to our allies and our potential enemies, that the government continues, that he is in charge. And he does that brilliantly. He does it uh, most brilliantly, I think, in how he choreographs the picture of the swearing in aboard Air Force One. You have to realize that the Kennedy people did not want Mrs. Kennedy to participate in that picture. Johnson understood the value of having Mrs. Kennedy in this photograph. He understood that he needed to convey this image of continuity. So he asks Mrs. Kennedy to participate. He asks Kenny O'Donnell to go back and get Mrs. Kennedy. And Mrs. Kennedy, who is just a model of grace and dignity and strength, says, uh, it's the least that I can do. And that picture is, is uh, the plane takes off about three minutes after that picture is taken. The photographer goes to the AP in Dallas. So while Johnson is making his way back to Washington, that picture of the swearing in is projected to the rest of the nation. So it sends exactly the image that Lyndon Johnson needed to send, and it sent it um, as quickly as could possibly be done. 
Johnson, just so you know, also wanted to choreograph the exit from the plane at Andrews Air Force Base when they arrived in, uh, in Washington. But uh, on that occasion, the Kennedy uh, group refused to cooperate. And you remember, you probably have all seen these images of, of this small sort of cargo truck coming down with the casket and Mrs. Kennedy and Robert Kennedy, who had boarded from the front of the plane and walked through the back, and the other Kennedy aides. What I found in the, um, uh, the House Select Committee on Assassinations, their papers are in the National Archives in Washington, and I found an interview with one of the Kennedy aides, which, which uh, proves that what happened is someone went through and handpicked all the people who were going to leave with the body, uh, leaving behind the, some of the Kennedy aides who actually were cooperating with Johnson on the plane. So that scene of confusion of the Kennedy people getting off and leaving um, uh, is one against the carefully scripted image that Lyndon Johnson wanted to, to present that evening. But also you see Johnson the next day. Johnson meets with the key members of Kennedy's foreign policy team. Dean Russ, the Secretary of State, Sec Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara. In both cases, they went to the executive office building, the old executive office building, expecting to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Lyndon Johnson. They walk in, there's Lyndon Johnson, but there's a whole bank of reporters and photographers there. So Lyndon Johnson wanted to get them to sit down and tell him in front of the national media that they were going to remain and be a part of his administration. Uh, it was an important message for him to convey. And what's striking to me is that a man who's so brilliant in using the media in these 24 hours would later be so clumsy uh, and, um, uh, in the way in his relationship with the media. And you also see it's not just Johnson, the tactician. That evening, November 22, 1963, Johnson comes back to Washington. Later in the evening, he goes to his private residence called the Elms in Washington, D.C. Some friends are over. He finally goes to bed around 12 o'clock at night, and Johnson was never one to sleep a lot. He changed into his pajamas. He gets into his king-sized, his super-sized king bed, uh, and he invites three of his aides, Jack Valenti, Bill Moyers, and Cliff Carter, to join him. And there, Johnson, sitting in the bed, propped up with some pillows, uh, with Lady Bird tossing and turning, trying to sleep next to him, laid out his vision of the Great Society. The Great Society was born within hours of the Kennedy assassination. So you get a sense of Lyndon Johnson as a visionary leader, someone who had a clear sense of where he wanted to take the nation. And his, this ingrained compassion for the poor, his desire to push along the, the, the Kennedy, the stalled Kennedy civil rights legislation to do things for senior citizens. So there's, you see, I think, a, a visionary Johnson and also a Johnson who's a brilliant tactician. But you also see in these 24 hours the fatal flaw, what would become the fatal flaw of the Johnson presidency. Lyndon Johnson was devious and manipulative. He, he was so concerned, so worried about the reaction of the Kennedys that he made a member of the Kennedy group somehow responsible for every major decision he made in that 24 hours. So he claimed that Kenny O'Donnell told him to take Air Force One, the Kennedy plane, the plane that President Kennedy had flown on, in on. When in reality, the Secret Service had made that decision for him to take Air Force One. They did it because they thought there was better communications on that plane. And later in the whole issue about the taking of the oath, Lyndon Johnson clearly wanted to take the oath of office and he wanted to take it in Dallas. He wanted to take it in part because he was afraid if he didn't take it and he was stuck in a plane for three hours on his way back to Washington, that the Kennedys would somehow find some way to deny him the presidency. But he manipulates Robert Kennedy. He calls the Attorney General and he, he manipulates Robert Kennedy into a, to agreeing that he should take the oath of office in Dallas on Air Force One. And then when everyone else from the Kennedy group comes to the plane, he tells them that it was Robert's idea. So it's so many times along the way, he just, he tells so many lies when he doesn't have to tell lies. And I think it's that, that penchant for deceit and dishonesty and insecurity that would become what would later be known as the credibility gap that would erode the moral authority of Lyndon Johnson's presidency. And what I'm struck by is, in the end, there's this irony that, that the assassination of President Kennedy made the Johnson presidency possible. But it also doomed it to failure. Because it was Kennedy's death. If Kennedy had not been assassinated, it's very unlikely that Lyndon Johnson never would have become president. Kennedy and Johnson would have won re-election in 1964. And by 1968, if uh, things had been going well, Robert would have been the heir to the throne, throne not Lyndon Johnson. But the assassination also 
doomed him to failure because it created a myth. It created this myth of the heroic JFK. It was a myth that neither Lyndon Johnson, certainly not Lyndon Johnson, but really no other political figure in America could have lived up to. So Lyndon Johnson spends out, spends the final days of his presidency and of his life living in the long shadow of the tragedy of November 22nd, 1963. You know, let me stop there. What I'd like to do before we take questions and answers, and first, if you have a question, we have a C-SPAN microphone, so we'll ask that you wait until the microphone arrives. But before we get to there, I, what, I need to make one announcement, and that is um, uh, why I obviously want you to read the book. <laughs> it's very important that you read the book. Um, I want to point out the History Channel has done a wonderful two-hour documentary that's based on the book, which really captures a lot of the, uh, the issues and the personalities involved. The producer of that two-hour documentary is over here. His name is Anthony Cicchino. Anthony, stand up for a second. Uh, Anthony, uh, I keep telling Anthony that he needs to change his first name. Anthony won an Emmy uh, a few years ago, and I you know, if I was Anthony, I, my first name would be Emmy Award winning producer. <laughs> and my middle name would be Anthony, but he likes Anthony, so he sticks with that. Um, but I think that Anthony did a, a really a brilliant job in, uh, in, uh, in this documentary, and it captures, it's, it's, for me, it was, was fascinating to watch how he uh, took uh, the words on a page and transformed them into this gripping visual uh, representation. Uh, on television. If you haven't seen the documentary, I'd encourage you to watch it. It's, you can see it, uh, check your local listings, or you can go to the History Channel website at history.com and find the DVD. So that's my, my one announcement. So uh, the microphone, uh, we have a question here? Yes. Um, even though you started out by saying that your book clearly does not deal with the conspiracies, this is, as you pointed out, is on most people's minds. So the question is, what is your favorite since there are so many, the mob did it, et cetera, et cetera. What is your favorite? Yeah, well, you know, I'm in a distinct minority. The question is, what is my favorite conspiracy theory? And I, my, the answer is none of them. Um, I am among the, which, I, am, I am one of those crazy people. Whoa, <laughs> whoa, <laughs> he liked me until just then. <laughs> um, uh, my personal feeling is, that uh, you know, the Warren Commission, that Lee Harvey Oswald assassinated President Kennedy. For the purposes of this book, my, my own view is really irrelevant because I'm really looking at what Lyndon Johnson knew in the 24 hours after the assassination. And all Lyndon Johnson knew, while Lyndon Johnson is flying back to Washington on Air Force One, he hears the name Lee Harvey Oswald for the first time. The first time he hears it is in, the, in connection with the shooting of Officer Tibbet. And what's fascinating about looking at this issue of who shot JFK in the first 24 hours, what I was struck by, separate from all the theories about, about whether Oswald did it or not, is how worried Lyndon Johnson is. Because you, when the, you know, the information about Oswald's coming out pretty quickly. And Lyndon Johnson finds out this man lived in the Soviet Union, that he was somehow connected with the Cubans. Um, so he, what Johnson is so afraid of is he's speeding back to Washington about to uh, try to assemble a government for the first time is that he's going to be pressured into a war with the Soviet Union. Whether Oswald acted alone or whether he acted as part of a conspiracy, Lyndon Johnson is afraid that there's going to be such a public backlash against a man who once lived in the Soviet Union and pledged fidelity to Fidel Castro that he's going to be forced uh, into a war. And Johnson, remember, had been around Washington for a long time. He remembered the days of Joseph McCarthy. And he worried, would this, would the assassination, whether Oswald was a part of a conspiracy or not, his simple biography and the facts of his life would, uh, could produce uh, the same result, which is tremendous public outpouring and, and uh, desire to, to, uh, to go to war with Cuba or with the Soviet Union. Yes, over here. Let's wait for the microphone there. Yeah. Uh, as far as the continuity of executive authority, wasn't Lyndon Johnson in the House of Representatives on April 12, 1945, and experienced uh, the also the un, uh, unprepared death of a president and the takeover of power during the Second World War going on, both against the Nazis and the Japanese, and saw, I mean, this is a tradition in American history. What I'd like to ask you regarding that is, uh, uh, just put the words together, sadly, four presidents have been assassinated. 
Several others narrowly missed such tragedy. Other than the near immediate death of President Kennedy, can you compare or contrast the other executive transfers? It's a great question. Uh, sounds like it's one of the questions I ask in my exams. <laughs> um, let me, let me, there's a couple different dimensions to your question. First of all, let me raise the first, the issue you raised, which is a very good issue about, um, about what happened when, when Franklin Roosevelt died. And what's interesting, you know, when Roosevelt dies, um, the, the, uh, the people who were with Roosevelt in uh, Warm Springs uh, contact the White House, and uh, the first person they tell is Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor Roosevelt is attending a concert when she gets a notice to come back to the White House immediately. She comes back to the White House, and it's, it's, uh, all this is playing out outside of the public eye. Um, and, and then Harry Truman, it is Eleanor Roosevelt who summons Harry Truman to the White House. It is the former first lady who has no constitutional role or power who informs the vice president, Harry Truman, that, the, that Roosevelt is dead and that Harry Truman is now president. And within a few hours, I think 7 o'clock that evening, within a few hours in the, in, the, um, in the White House, Harry Truman takes the oath of office. What's so different about this is this takes place in the full glare of the media. And I think you cannot understand the assassination and understand the impact it has had on an entire generation. I look around, I see people who are my age and, and uh, some older. You remember where you were when Kennedy was shot, in large part because of the media. This was the first event in human history that the entire nation experienced, an entire nation experienced in real time. You know, if with, the, with, the, with the Roosevelt assassination, people had played out on radio, but people were watching this on television. You know, Kennedy used television to build a personal bond with the public, and then the public felt an intense sense of loss when they saw him assassinated. Um, there were, within a few minutes of the shooting, the, Walter Cronkite was on CBS announcing that there have been shots fired at the presidential motorcade. A few minutes after that, he was actually on the air, and he stayed on the air, and all the other networks, both ABC, all the other networks, <laughs> only three back then, uh, ABC, NBC, this is before the History Channel, but, but uh, uh, both NBC, CBS, and ABC were on the air, and they stayed on the air through the entire weekend. Uh, so there is, um, this is playing out in public. And what I was struck by, you know, I was, it's interesting, I was writing this, uh, this section about the oath of office, right around the same time that Barack Obama was taking the oath of office and John Roberts forgot the Constitution. Um, and I was struck that, that the next day, Roberts, uh, they administered the oath of office again in private. Because what's interesting, on the presidential plane on Air Force One, Johnson arrives back on Air Force One. He's like, do I have to take the oath? Am I president of the United States? Or am I not president of the United States until I take the oath of office? And no one really knew the answer to that. By the time, you know, there's that, the, the press conference that Malcolm Kildoff is holding at Parkland Hospital when he uh, says, uh, when he announces to the public that Kennedy is dead. It's roughly around 1.36 or so. Well, the first two questions he gets is, where are Lyndon Johnson and has he taken the oath of office? So all this, you know, it's all playing out in the full glare of the media. The other presidents who were assassinated all lingered. You know, when McKinley was shot at the ex exposition in Buffalo in 1901, he lingered for days. Uh, actually, there were reports that he was getting better, and he took a dramatic turn toward, uh, 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 after, I think he lived for about seven or eight days. Um, when Garfield died, he died, uh, he, he lingered for time. So this was, what was unique about the Kennedy assassination was that he was the first president to die instantly, and he died in full view of the public. And I think that changed the entire dynamic. It changed the relationship between the public and, and, and the presidency. And it also created extraordinary expectations and demands on Lyndon Johnson. You know, when Lyndon Johnson gets off that plane, gets off Air Force One at Andrews Air Force Base at, at uh, 612 uh, on the evening of November 22nd, most of the public is hearing his voice for the first time. You know, Candid Camera, the, the TV show? Well, there was a Candid Camera skit about a month or so before November 22nd. Where, you know what the, uh, the joke was? Do you know who Lyndon Johnson is? And something like 30% of people didn't even know who he was. So Lyndon Johnson is, in a matter of hours, forced to not only assume the power of the presidency under the most hor horrible of circumstances, but to do so in the full glare of the media, he has to introduce himself. And those words that he speaks at Air Force, the Air Force Base, Andrews Air Force Base, are the first, it's the first time Americans have heard a Southern accent.
from an American president, since, certainly since the days of Woodrow Wilson. Um, this was new and shocking, and it just compounds the problem. It's one of the reasons why I view Johnson in a favorable light, because I think that, that this was an unprecedented crisis that he faced, and despite his, his limitations and his, his penchant for deception, that on the big issues, um, he faced an unprecedented crisis, and he handled it remarkably well. That was a long-winded answer to your question, but it was a very good question. Uh, let's just go here, and we have someone in the back, too. Yeah, but that being said, what did uh, Lyndon Johnson think that Robert Kennedy could do to stop a presidency? I mean, it is, it, he, they may have not known, but there is, cl there is some clarity in the Constitution to succession. Right. So no, I, I, have, it's pure have? paranoia. It is pure paranoia. The Constitution made Lyndon Johnson president of the United States, not the Kennedys, and not the Attorney General. What I will point out is this, which is sort of an interesting wrinkle in this, is um, uh, but this is before the 25th Amendment, which sort of laid out a procedure for uh, filling a, an office that's, that's vacant and, and, and the pre vice president taking over uh, in case of uh, the president being disabled. The, uh, the first president and vice president to have a, a formal agreement about when this would happen, would be, would, how they would proceed were the president to be disabled was Eisenhower and Nixon. And the agreement that Eisenhower and Nixon wrote up said essentially that, that if for some reason the president became incapacitated and was unable, wasn't aware that he was incapacitated, the procedure they would use is the vice president would have to consult and, and get the support of half the cabinet in order to assume the powers of the presidency. Lyndon Johnson and John F. Kennedy came to a similar agreement, but there's one little clause that had to be running around in Lyndon Johnson's mind on November 22nd. Kennedy said that he not only had to seek the support of half the cabinet, he had to consult with the Attorney General of the United States. Attorney General of the United States was the President's brother, Robert F. Kennedy, and Lyndon Johnson's arch enemy in the White House. So you have to think. Again, you know, a lot of this is speculative. We don't know what's going through people's minds, but you, Lyndon Johnson, being the political uh, creature that he is, knew every word in that document and every punctuation point. And he knew that, you know, so what, what, was he, what was he thinking? Was he thinking, was this going to be a Woodrow Wilson situation? Did he, and in his paranoid mind, did he believe that somehow the Kennedys were going to try to hide the fact that, that President Kennedy was disabled? And maybe if he, maybe if he lived, you know, his query is, first of all, if he leaves the hospital and Kennedy lives, will the public believe that he abandoned the president and abandoned the first lady? Uh, if he leaves and he's isolated on a plane for three hours, you know, what's the attorney general doing? What's it behind his back? You know, are they going to, there's a separate military chain of command, which goes uh, through the Secretary of Defense, uh, uh, which is Robert McNamara. Would they, he, you know, you have to think that Johnson is playing out all these scenarios. When you boil them all down, they're all paranoid fantasies. There is the, the, the American public would accept Lyndon Johnson as president because the Constitution makes him president, not the Kennedy family. And he didn't need the approval of the Kennedy family. But he is so, you know, Robert Kennedy vehemently opposed Johnson's appointment to the ticket. And there's that famous scene at the, uh, the Biltmore Hotel in 1960 when, when first President Kennedy appears to ask Lyndon Johnson to be on the ticket. And then Robert goes down and tries to talk him out of it. Um, uh, so, and you know, they, there's this great story about when they, when, when John F. Kennedy was thinking about running for, uh, for president, he sent Robert to Lyndon Johnson. I mean, Lyndon Johnson is the big mover and shaker in Washington. He goes to Lyndon Johnson to see whether Lyndon Johnson is, A, going to oppose him, going to run against him, and if Johnson's going to try to stop him by supporting Humphrey. So he goes to the, you know, the, the LBJ ranch, and uh, RFK is a fairly slightly built man, and um, Johnson takes some deer hunting. And instead of giving him, and I, I don't know much about rifles, five people here know more, instead of giving him a regular uh, deer rifle, he gives him a high-powered shotgun. So uh, Robert Kennedy pulls the trigger and he, you know, the, the, uh, the, he knocks him down about uh, like three feet and he cuts the, his, his forehead. And uh, Lyndon Johnson makes some comment about, you know, that's not like a real, the way a real man shoots a gun or something along those lines. So you know, Robert Kennedy hated him from the very beginning. Um, and Johnson was convinced all the whole time he's vice president, he's convinced that Robert Kennedy's trying to remove him from the ticket. Uh, Johnson is convinced that, that Robert is, is conniving all the bad stories, every scandal 
that comes out in the media that's somehow connected to Johnson. Johnson's con convinced that it's Robert Kennedy. So you cannot sort of, it's hard now for us to understand the, the uh, hostility uh, that existed between these two men. And I think that feeds Johnson's paranoia uh, on this day. It's clearly paranoia. It has no basis in, in reason or rationality. But sometimes people are irrational. <coughs> yeah. Right. But at the, the, the point was that this is about death, not about uh, the president being incapacitated. But for the first 40 minutes, Lyndon Johnson doesn't know that. Um, and after they're on Air Force One, he doesn't know whether he officially becomes president until he takes the oath of office. So one of the reasons why he wants to take it so fast was he thinks that once he takes the oath, there's nothing they can do. The question is, what could they do if he didn't take the oath? Nothing. But, you know, he just, he needs that. He needs to know that he's president. Uh, yes, I see questions in the back there. There's a question here. I should have, I should have, uh, you know, I should have prefaced this by telling you that I only take easy questions and compliments. These, these tough uh, questions are just. Uh, I wanted to ask about, uh, in the early part of your book, you discussed the ways in which uh, the Kennedys and Johnson tried to uh, solicit writers to provide, a, you know, an account of the, that day that would support their view of what had happened. And you talk about William Manchester's very influential narrative, The Death of a President. Uh, could you comment a little more on the way in which that influenced the, the narrative uh, that Manchester provided influenced the American public's view of Johnson uh, because it was probably the most important book that was published on the subject until uh, today. during the 60s, yeah. yeah. During the 60s, at least, yeah. Like he said, until uh, during the 1960s. Very good, thank you. Um, no, you're absolutely right. Remember, there was a, there was a great article, actually, uh, in Vanity Fair recently about uh, William Manchester. And, you know, the Kennedy family hired Manchester to tell the official version. Uh, Mrs. Kennedy discouraged other people from, uh, from writing about the assassination. And Manchester is a brilliant storyteller, and I actually admire his book. I think he, for the, he gets most things right in that book. He did a tremendous amount of research. And when you go back and look through his research notes, it's very impressive, the amount of work he did in such a short period of time. You know, he gets most things right. He gets Lyndon Johnson almost completely wrong. And, you know, there's some correspondence where Manchester said that he just, he didn't like Lyndon Johnson. He never liked Lyndon Johnson. And when the, when this, when the, the book was finally uh, ready for publication and it was serialized, you know, it led to a, a lawsuit with uh, the Kennedy family. And, and Mrs. Kennedy was primarily concerned that uh, Manchester had violated her privacy, that she had sat down for long interviews and shared with him many details about her feelings in the hours after the assassination. And then a couple years later, she regretted doing that, and she uh, blocked Manchester from using those notes. So, for example, if you go to the Wesleyan University archive, all the interviews are there except the ones with Mrs. Kennedy and Robert Kennedy. And some of the other Kennedy peoples are there, but a lot of things are blacked out. So that was part of the agreement that Manchester made with them. And she wanted him to remove this material. She also was concerned. She felt, and Robert Kennedy believed, that the portrait, that, that it was simply too negative a portrait of Lyndon Johnson. That even the Kennedy, I mean, it was so bad, uh, the portrait of Lyndon Johnson, even the Kennedy people objected to it. And Robert Kennedy was afraid that people would see this as nothing more than a uh, political attack uh, by the Kennedys against a sitting president at a time when uh, Robert Kennedy is now in the Senate. So the Kennedys really did not um, accept this view. No one accepted the view, this, 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 this um, very negative portrait uh, that he paints of Lyndon Johnson. I was, and going through it, you know, he's, what Manchester says, for example, that Lyndon Johnson um, was simply at the whim of the Secret Service agents when he's in Parkland Hospital. He refuses to make any decisions on his own. Well, you know, the Secret Service were in his face. They're, they're, they're insisting that he leave Parkland Hospital right away and go back to Air Force One, and he's saying no. So he clearly is his own man, even in Parkland Hospital. And there's so many other comments he makes about Lyndon Johnson I think are just unnecessary and appropriate. But that book, that incredibly influential book, has done more than any other to define our understanding of Lyndon Johnson. And what he, Manchester paints a portrait of this boorish president who is insensitive to uh, Mrs. Kennedy and the Kennedy family, who seems over-eager to assume the powers of the presidency, and is just, just clumsy. And, uh, you know, but Johnson has this tough role to play. He's walking a fine line. On the one hand, he's trying to be sensitive to, to the grief uh, 
profound grief for the Kennedy family. At the same time, he needs to lead a nation. So when they arrive at, at Andrews Air Force Base, the Kennedys wanted that to be a private, they didn't want the, the entire world to see Mrs. Kennedy. Uh, they didn't want them to see the, the casket carrying the president's body, but Johnson insisted that the national media be there. He understood the power of symbols, so he's walking this fine line. And I think that you know, in looking at the day, I, I under, the, the Kennedys, the, the, the family and the, the people around the, the, the slain president, it's hard to, to appreciate their, their grief and their sorrow and their, their sense of loss. But there is a sense of entitlement that I found difficult to, to comprehend. Uh, and I think that overall, Lyndon Johnson manages that pretty well. Now, Johnson, of course, is not, Johnson doesn't cooperate with Manchester. He refuses to sit down for an interview with Manchester. And if you go to the Johnson Library, which, by the way, is a wonderful place to work, um, you see all these notes uh, where Manchester's constantly writing, mainly Jack Valenti, uh, asking for access to the president. They keep putting them off and putting them off and putting them off. And then comes along Jim Bishop. And Jim Bishop uh, was a popular writer. And, and you know, I, it was interesting for me, when I write history books, I had the sense that historians, we need to be objective, need to be fair-minded. You know, and Jim Bishop is sending these love letters to Lyndon Johnson about, oh, you're such a wonderful leader. I couldn't imagine writing a negative book about you. So uh, he, Johnson, agrees to, uh, to uh, participate in a project that Jim Bishop is doing uh, about a day in the life of Lyndon Johnson, which is this, this puff piece. But really what they're both trying to do, what Lyndon Johnson does with Jim Bishop, is to tell his side of the story. So Jim Bishop comes out with a competing book a few years after Manchester called um, uh, the, the Day Kennedy Died. Uh, but by 1968, people were sick of Lyndon Johnson, and no one wanted to hear his side of the story. But oddly enough, I think Bishop is closer to the truth than Manchester. But how many people here have read Manchester's book or know of Manchester's book? How many people have heard of Jim Bishop's book? Okay, we've got a really smart crowd. <laughs> um, most people don't know who Jim Bishop is. Most people haven't read the book. But uh, I think Bishop actually, although his account, if, if, if Manchester is too critical, I think Bishop errs on the other side, and he sees no fault with Lyndon Johnson, and he blames the Kennedys for all things that are wrong with America. And, I just, and, and what I've tried to do is find sort of a balance be, uh, between the two. Yes. Uh, we have a, one more question. I, I can take, we're going to comment on a question. Bishop wrote a book on the day Lincoln died. That's right, and the day Christ died. He picked well, all these great I'm figures. I'm not sure of who to compare it with whom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but certainly Lincoln. When was that? When did that come out? That was earlier. Well, obviously earlier. Yeah. Most likely. Uh, what what earlier. year? I don't know. So he's using, you know, Kennedy, which he witnessed himself as an example of something to write about in reference to certainly to his success. I think the, the uh, book. The day uh, Lincoln died was a successful book and right. helped make the bishop right. a very popular But this one didn't writer. work as well. We have time for one more question. Hello there. Uh, yes, yes, over here. I think we have... Uh, uh, Johnson was uh, from Texas, wasn't he? Yes, he was. So he, he wouldn't know about that place where, he, uh, where Kennedy was shot, and he must have... He must surely be a paranoid, because what you said about... Uh, Vanity Fair, you know, in, I read Vanity Fair, and, and, and there was a warning not, uh, of Kenny not to go there. Right. Well, that's what's, the, what's interesting about this story is that Johnson did not want Kennedy to go to Texas. You yeah. know, Texas was his turf. Um, he, there was a debate going on between two factions of the Democratic Party, which I won't get into here, and Johnson clearly sided with John Conley, who was the governor of Texas. And uh, Kennedy, Kennedy was trying to find some common ground. Johnson simply wanted Kennedy to leave Texas to him. Now, he and Conley had done pretty well in Texas politics. He thought he had a pretty good idea of how to manage it. But Kennedy insisted. Actually, Kennedy, at one point, cut Johnson out of the discussions about the, Kennedy, about the trip to Texas. And he planned it on his own. And Johnson, one day, uh, uh, has, uh, finds out that John Conley, who's the governor, is in town. And he finds out that Connolly had a meeting with President Kennedy to talk about the trip. So Johnson isn't even involved in the trip. He's also always worried. He's concerned about Dallas. He believes he knows Dallas is a right-wing hotspot. So he's, um, he's opposed to the, the idea of an open motorcade. He wants Kennedy to go to a couple of locations, raise some money, and get out of Texas. So Johnson, from the very beginning, Johnson was not in favor of, of uh, Kennedy uh, going to Texas. Uh, he opposed the trip, but Kennedy was Kennedy wanted to raise money, and he wanted to get a measure of what was going to take place in Texas. Texas was a key state. Remember, this is this is Kennedy had already come out for a civil rights bill, and uh, uh, 
the, the whole issue of civil rights was turning the once solid Democratic South into a Republican South. This is the, you see the very beginnings of this, and Kennedy's trying to get a sense of how he's going to handle that. That's, I'm told that's the last question we can take. I want to thank all of you, really, for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. And thanks to C-SPAN and Barnes & Noble. Thank Stephen Gillan is the author of The Pact, Bill Clinton, Newt Gingrich, and the Rivalry That Defined a Generation. He's a history professor at the University of Oklahoma and resident historian at the History Channel. For more information, visit history.com and search his name. Very detailed reports of what they were doing on that day, what they saw, and when they saw them. Now, most people, the few people who have used this report have been looking at it primarily to glean information about the assassination. But if you look at it instead to try to get a sense of what Lyndon Johnson is doing, you get this this, this uh, great understanding of, of Lyndon Johnson and every step he's taking and who's in the room and who he's talking to, and it's really essential in trying to tell the story. So, so what do you end up with and what's new? So there's new questions you're asking using a different format and you have new sources. So what is it that I'm able to say about November 22nd, 1963 that no one has said before? Well, the first part of this story that I think is important is the events that take place in Parkland Hospital, the roughly 40 minutes that Lyndon Johnson is at Parkland Hospital from 1240 until around 130 when he leaves for Air Force One. And the question that I try to, the question that I asked of the material, which has not been asked before, is why does it take so long for Lyndon Johnson to find out that Kennedy is dead? According to the Warren Commission, Kennedy is shot at 12.30. They arrive at, the, at Parkland Hospital at 12.40. Kennedy is pronounced dead at 1 o'clock. Lyndon Johnson finds out that Kennedy is dead at 1.20. I think that timeline is actually wrong for reasons I'd be happy to elaborate on later. But here's what happens. Lyndon Johnson, just to set the stage for Parkland Hospital, Lyndon Johnson is two cars behind President Kennedy in the motorcade as they turn on the Dealey Plaza. When the first shot rings out, Johnson hears it, and he doesn't think anything of it. He said he's been in motorcades his whole life. For him, it was just, it sounded like backfire from a motorcycle. He wasn't the least bit alarmed. Rufus Youngblood, who was the Secret Service agent sitting in the front seat of the car, hears the same sound. He's also not alarmed. But what he sees does alarm him. He looks out, and he's looking now at the grassy knoll, where the vice presidential car is making the turn onto Elm. And he sees people falling to the ground. And then he looks ahead, and he sees in front of him, he sees what he describes as unusual movements in the presidential car. So Youngblood leaps out of the front seat of the car and he jumps over the back seat and he grabs Lyndon Johnson and he throws him to the floor of the car. And as Johnson is being thrown to the floor of the car, you hear the second shot and the third shot. And depending on what theories you believe, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth shot. But Lyndon Johnson is on the floor of the limousine. He hears these shots, but he doesn't see anything. He hasn't seen anything in a presidential motorcade. As soon as he's on the floor and, and, and Rufus Youngblood, all 180 pounds of Rufus History Professor Stephen Gillan details the hours following the Kennedy assassination on November 22, 1963, and the transfer of the presidency to Lyndon Johnson. Mr. Gillan uses newly declassified archival sources to explore the first hours of the Johnson administration. Barnes & Noble in New York City hosts the hour-long event. You know, I think the question, when you write a book like this, the first question that you have to answer is, do we really need another book about the Kennedy assassination? Is there anything new to be said about the assassination of President Kennedy? Are there new materials that, are, that have suddenly become available, that have not been available for the past 46 years, that allow us to see these events in a different light? And obviously, my answer to that question is yes, for very selfish purposes. Um, most of the books, the vast majority of books, and you, know, you could fill a small library with, with uh, books and articles that have been written about the assassination, they focus on one question, one singular question, and that is, who shot JFK? Where did the bullets come from? Was there a shooter on the grassy knoll? Was Oswald, was Oswald a patsy? You know, was this part of a, a coup on the part of the military-industrial complex because of initiatives that Kennedy had taken? These issues are fascinating. And they have inspired what is and remain and will remain a passionate debate among people on all different sides of, of this issue. That's not what this book is about. 
I am not writing a book about who shot JFK. I have no new theories to offer about where the bullets came from or who shot JFK. This is actually a very different book. What I'm interested in is not who shot JFK. I'm interested in the transfer of political power that takes place in the hours after the assassination. And I want to move the focus away from the tragedy that's unfolding in the presidential limousine and move it back about 60 feet to the car carrying Lyndon Johnson. Follow Lyndon Johnson over the course of the day as he goes to Parkland Hospital and then to Air Force One and then back to Washington, D.C. to give people a sense of the texture of the decisions that he had to face and the choices that he confronted. When you think about it, the Kennedy assassination represented the most dramatic and sudden transfer of political power in American history. Kennedy was the first chief executive to die instantly from his wounds, even Abraham Lincoln who was shot at point-blank range at the Ford Theater, survived and lived until the following morning when he died. Kennedy died instantly, which confronted Johnson with what I believe was an unprecedented crisis. What I'm interested in is the issues of crisis management and presidential leadership in the hours that followed the assassination. And I focus on the first 24 hours. You know, which is very different from other books that I've written and the books that other professional historians, right? Because normally what we're trying to do is to connect the dots, to tell the story of change over a period of time. But what I try to do here instead is to focus on a single 24-hour period to give you a sense of the texture of the moment. You know, my students over the years have always complained that, that number one, I talk too fast, and number two, that history is boring. They say history is boring because we know the conclusion. We know the end of the story, so why do we need to learn about dates and names and times? And I, what I find fascinating about history is being able to go back in a moment of time and understand that the past has many different possible paths, that there are lots of possibilities, choices that were not taken, and to put people back in that moment at that time to understand the range of choices, in this case, that Lyndon Johnson faced, and to realize how contingency and unintended consequences play in the historical process and produce a result which no one at the time could have anticipated. And by focusing on 24 hours, by, by focusing on some of the, deal, the details that oftentimes get airbrushed out of history, I think we're able to transport people back to that moment. So you not only can now, with the benefit of hindsight, get a sense of to reevaluate some of the decisions that Lyndon Johnson made, but you can also put yourself back in that moment. So you're at Parkland Hospital, and someone comes to you, and you, you have the same information in front of you that Lyndon Johnson had in front of him. You find out the president has been shot, that this is possibly the first uh, in, uh, shot in what could potentially be a confrontation with the Soviet Union. What do you do in that moment? What choices do you make? I know what I would do. I would hyperventilate and pass out. That's why I'm a professor and not a president. But it allows the individuals, people who are reading this book, the idea is to allow people to go back in that moment of time and experience it, and experience the same type of situations and the same choices that Lyndon Johnson confronted. And not only is the, the framework different, but I also, in terms of the issue, there are new sources that are available. And uh, Youngblood are on top of them. The car picks up speed. They begin this frantic race to Parkland Hospital. Johnson doesn't know what's going on. He feels the car accelerate. He hears, we have to realize, this car is going 70 miles an hour. It's an open limousine. The air is blowing through it. The radio is at full blast. Johnson wanted to hear the, how the local radio stations were covering the motorcade, so he had the radio on the whole time. So they're racing the Parkland Hospital. He keeps looking over to make sure Lady Bird is okay. But he hears some chatter over the Secret Service channel, but he doesn't really know what is taking place and what's happening. Rufus Youngblood, at one point, there's so much noise that in order to talk to Johnson, he leans down and yells into his ear, we're going to a hospital. Uh, it's possible that there's been an incident in the presidential motorcade. When we get to the hospital, we're going to take you to a secure location. Do you understand? And Johnson says, yes, partner. So they pull up to Parkland, Parkland Hospital. And I realize that Johnson's car is just a few seconds behind President Kennedy's uh, uh, limousine. The Kennedy limousine is parked a few yards away, and the president is laying in the arms, in the lap of the First Lady. But Johnson doesn't see any of this, because as soon as they screech to a halt, agents surround him, they rush him in the Parkland Hospital, they take him to minor medical. They close the blinds, they move, remove people, they put a guard at the gate, and put him in booth 13 in minor medical. So there you have Lyndon Johnson, Lady Bird, Rufus Youngblood, in a, in a room with a sterile metal operating table, examination table, and two plastic chairs.
That's all. At this point, Lyndon Johnson knows nothing. So the question then is, is why does it take so long for him to get information about what's happened to the president? Just about everybody else in the presidential motorcade has either, either saw the shots or they saw Kennedy's body when they arrived at Parkland Hospital and they had an understanding of just how serious this was. So Johnson wants information. He wants to know what's going on. He doesn't know whether Connolly's been shot, the president's been shot, the first lady, or whether no one's hurt. He gets his first report from Emory Roberts, who was the shift supervisor of the Secret Service. Now, Emory Roberts, as soon as the car is pulled into Parkland Hospital, Emory Roberts jumps out of the backup car and goes to the presidential car. He opens up the back door, and he wants to get a sense of what the pres how serious the president's wounds are. And he lifts up the first lady's arm and looks at the president's head. And he tells William Manchester, in the interview he did with Manchester, that at that moment he knew that Kennedy was dead, and that Lyndon Johnson was President of the United States. And he said, my Secret Service manual tells me to protect the President of the United States, and that was Lyndon Johnson. So he says to Roy Kellerman, you stay with me. Uh, I am very grateful to the family of William Manchester, who gave me access to uh, all of the research materials that Mr. Manchester used to write his very controversial and best-selling book, uh, The Death of a President, was published in 1967. And if you go back, these materials were opened up last year for the first time. I was the first one to use them. And these materials, you know, almost all of these people, with a few exceptions, are now dead. But when you go back and you look at the interviews, Manchester interviewed all the major players back in 1964 and 1965 when this material was still fresh. And these people come alive. And what also comes alive are some of the, the human dimensions to this story, the human dimensions that have been, I think, left out of the Warren Commission, for example, which, as you know, is a legal brief, which is sort of very clinical, very concise, but also... Uh, uh, it is not, it's focused on solving a, pr a crime, and it's not focused on Lyndon Johnson or his actions after, um, uh, after the assassination. And I also found that people just volunteered and gave Manchester material, material that was not available to the Warren Commission. So there are, for example, documents uh, in the Manchester papers which he chose not to use and parts of interviews which he chose not to use, which I think provide a fresh light, new perspective on the events that took place that day. I also, I, I sought out the Manchester papers and I found them there at Wesleyan University in the Special Collections uh, Archive at Wesleyan University. I also came across a very valuable and useful oral history that was conducted by the, President, the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library in 1978 with Brigadier General Godfrey McHugh. And McHugh was President Kennedy's Air Force aide on November 22, 1963. And this, is, this is just falls into the category of pure dumb luck. I happened to be working at the Kennedy Library on the day, 31 years after he conducted the interview, that McHugh's interview was declassified. So within hours of it being open to the public, I was able to get access to it and use it in this book for the first time. And I want to talk a little bit later on about some of the insights that this um, oral history provides us. But finally, there are just, because I'm asking different questions of the material, there's a lot of information that's been open to the public for a long time that other people looking into this issue have not focused on. There's a, at both the Johnson Library and at the National Archives in Washington, D.C., for example, there is a report conducted by the Secret Service where all the Secret Service agents involved in the, uh, the presidential detail and the vice presidential detail gave